Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Someone said, It is he. Others said, No, but it looks like him. He said, I am the man. They said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had, been, who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. The Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to, him, said to them, he put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? There was a division among them. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be, a Christ, to be Christ, he would be, he would to be put out of the synagogue. He was to, therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. For the second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner, he answered. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already. And you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you too want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why this is a marvel. You do not know where, he's, where he comes from? And yet, he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, 
But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, said, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel that we just heard does not tell us of the healing of a blind man, as we find in the other Gospels, but the healing of a man blind from his birth. And what's the difference? I can imagine losing sight when it's hard to begin to appreciate the courage it requires to live with the loss of what we take for granted so easily. But how does a person born blind experience the world? How do they imagine things known through the other senses, never seen and never looked upon? That this man in the gospel is born blind is no peripheral detail. He has not lost a capacity for light. He did not have it to begin with. He does not deal with light, darkness, shadow, and reflection. Jesus will not restore sight to this man He will grace him with a capacity that he never had. This miracle does not point just to the restoration of our human nature, but also to its total recreation. It says, Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. What Jesus is to do will bear resonance to the very beginnings of creation. He will reach into the very origins of human beings and do something that has never been done before, restore their capacity for the light which shines in the darkness. As God made man from the dust of the earth, so Jesus remakes the man born blind with the dust of the Jerusalem street and forms him anew. As the first man received the breath of life and became a living being, so this man is anointed with dust mixed with spittle from the mouth of Jesus and becomes transformed beyond recognition, so much so that people argue, is this actually the same man? His neighbors will ask, is this the man who used to sit and beg? Just like Jesus manifested after his resurrection, this man is not so easily recognizable. So deep and profound is the transformation that has happened to him. Until this point, The man himself had been a passive witness in the story, almost without form and void. Now he finds his voice and begins to speak for himself. His parents refuse to answer for him. His present state is beyond anything he received from them. He even begins to question the Pharisees who had come to question him. With his sight, there has come into being an increasing insight into who Jesus is and the gift that he brings. So the man owes his new being not to his parental origins 
or to his pedigree, according to the law of Moses, but to the sudden, unearned gift of the encounter with Jesus. Falling down to worship Jesus, he recognizes him not just as the source of his sight, but more importantly, as the origin of this new life. In Jesus, we are elevated into this new life. As the man born blind received a new capacity, a one he did not have before, a new way of experiencing the world, so we too receive a capacity for a deeper way of life to come to experience the familiar world around us in the unfamiliar light of Jesus. Jesus, who forever remains the light of the world. We receive this through our baptism. Our parents, our first parents in the garden had their eyes open, but they saw how far we had fallen from God, saw their nakedness and their shame. We have our eyes opened in a new way, just as the disciples did at Emmaus, when they saw the Lord in the scriptures and in the breaking of bread. And we perceive the new clothing of our humanity with Christ's own divine nature. I said we have received the capacity for living this new life in our baptism when the Lord himself anointed us with his own spirit. But this capacity in us weakens through our sin. We have become accustomed to darkness than to this divine light. Even now, as I speak, in many parts of the world, the church in many parts of the world has deliberately chosen darkness to light to plunge themselves into obscurity, to hide themselves so that no one may see their sins, and to call their sins virtues. This great darkness has come upon us suddenly, but actually anyone could have predicted it. It actually has been creeping up on us. If we are not careful, we will be like those frogs, you know, put frog in a pot and slowly bring it to the boil. The frog will never notice until it's too late and it's boiled to death in your frog soup. If we are not careful, this will come upon us. Before Mass, I gave you those cards saying Mother of the Unborn and spelling out our duties as Catholics and of people of right, upright conscience. It is not enough for us to hide behind authority and say, well, the bishops told us to do this and other authorities. You have a conscience. You have your duties. You know what to do. If we do not protest, if we do not urge the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry to make ethical alternatives, they never will. We can't just be happy with putting up with the experimental medicines they want to give us. We cannot, as Catholics, be happy with that. And to hide behind excuses, oh, the bishops told us to. Well, what would your mother say to that? If the bishop told you to jump over a cliff, would you do that? Of course, that is what our mothers would say. Use your conscience, your upright conscience, and work for the light, not for darkness. Each year, we pass through this holy season of Lent, and here on this Sunday, Leitari Sunday, Rejoice Sunday, we are more or less at the midway point of Lent, where even through the vestments, we are reminded that Lent is not about misery and gloom, that our prayer, fasting, and abstinence is about the joy of being seized by Jesus, to live in his presence, to live in his light, Last year, a survey found that among American Catholics, and I'm assuming American Catholics are better than most others, among American Catholics, 14% of Republican Catholics were against abortion in all circumstances. 14, one four. Of Democrat Catholics, only 5% were against abortion in all circumstances. This tells us, first of all, that politics is more important than religion. Their faith is actually secondary to who and what they are. But more than that, 14%, even 14%, how pathetic is that? That means what? I'm showing how bad my maths is. 86%, 86% 86 
86% of Republican Catholics, uh, the allegedly better ones, are for abortion in some circumstance, would tolerate it. There's an actress, actress called Anne Hathaway. I don't know what she does, I don't care. All I know is that she has the same name as Shakespeare's wife. And she, in an interview, she said she saw abortion as a blessing. A blessing. Well, I would dread to ask her to do the, the babysitting in case she blessed the children. How is she going to bless the children? Crush their skulls, vacuum the bits up, chop their limbs off. Is, she, is that her blessing? But if we deceive ourselves, if we don't stand up for the truth and show the world what the truth looks like, how will the world ever know? If our Catholicism matters less than our political views, then we are of all people in the world the most to be pitied. We are, as Jesus says, the light of the world. He makes us to be the light because he is the eternal uncreated light. And in this season of Lent, we are preparing ourselves for the healing touch of Jesus, preparing ourselves to see the world anew in this blaze of the Paschal fire, a light lit in a darkened tomb 2,000 years ago, a light which the world will never overcome and never understand, but a light that is committed to us through our baptism to shine forth in the darkness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.